Hello um, and welcome to another episode of 286 Project with me, Chris Akers. And on today's show, we have um, an author of this fantastic book about Africa Cup of Nations, um, which obviously took place earlier this year. It's a fantastic tournament. Uh, the author's name is Ben Jackson, and he's here to talk to me about this book. Hello, Ben. Hi, Chris. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, good. So I did read a book and I thought it was actually very good in terms of breaking down the history of the uh, tournament and also how certain teams have fared in the tournament over the years. But before we get into it, can you just explain a little bit about yourself, um, who you are, the journey that led you to write the book and basically why you decided to write about the Africa Cup of Nations? Yeah, sure. So it kind of, I guess, started if I really track it all the way back to kind of like, the, like 2011, maybe 2010, 2011, um, got invited by a friend while I was at sixth form to go out to Sierra Leone and do some football coaching. Um, I'd never heard of Sierra Leone at that point. I was quite like a naive teenager at the time, but I was like, yeah, no, I'm sure, sure that'd be quite fun. Uh, fell in love with the country and kind of like the people that we met and just kind of their passion for the game and stuff like that. And, I got really interested in the country's kind of history, obviously, with the civil war that took place in the 90s and then how to kind of recovered from there. So went on to study kind of international relations and then did like a, a master's in African politics. But all the while I followed the African Cup of Nations because I had this interest in football at the same time. Um, so I'd been following the tournament for quite a number of years until we got into COVID. And then I'd always kind of had an idea. I'd love to write a book one day. Um, I remember just thinking, oh, I wonder if there's a book out there on the history of the tournament because it's such a great tournament. I just would love to know more about it. Um, went looking for an English language book and there just wasn't one there. I was like, oh, okay, well, I'm interested in doing it. I quite enjoy doing research and stuff like that. So I was like, I may as well do it, do it myself. Uh, so I reached out to the publishing company, Pitch Publishing. I kind of gave them the structure, the idea I had for it. And they were like, more than happy to let me run with it. Um, so that's kind of how I got got to it it's kind of like COVID kind of accelerated a lot of people's plans I think in terms of thinking what why not just go for these things and see what see what can happen so that's kind of how I got to doing uh the book and I mean yeah I just thought I'm going to learn about the history at the same time as writing it so it's quite a nice kind of balance of me doing the research writing and then kind of learning at the same time so you said you went to Sierra Leone and that's when you first fell in love with the tournament what was it about the tournament itself that you really enjoy? Um, is it the quality of football? Is it the players? Like, what is it specifically? I think it's kind of a mixture of all all those things in the sense of it just feels like a different tournament to any of the other international tournaments that you watch. I feel like there's a little bit less of kind of what you'd call kind of like obviously you do have you have your bigger teams and you have your kind of lesser teams so we saw more at this tournament but the so-called lesser teams don't really care who they're playing up against in terms of like if these guys are world stars that play in the premier league league or like any of these leagues they they will go out there and play hard for 90 minutes and i just i've always found that fit that just has always felt different from other tour like international tournaments that i've watched um and you always get people trying stuff that you wouldn't normally get in other tournaments as well. Like people will try the tricks, they'll try the kind of the skill, they'll try shooting from 40 yards. Like it's just this kind of the way the game's played is just so different. And it's so kind of especially during the group stages where there's not as much on the line. It's it's, it's quite quick and it's quite like direct and stuff like that. So I've always kind of enjoyed that. But I think as well, having this kind of interest in the political and the historical side of Africa when you see the teams I'm really interested in kind of the countries as well and seeing like the different ways and the different kind of the cultural aspects of these countries that come through into their football teams and their fans and stuff like that so it's just one of those tournaments that just brings so much kind of colour and energy to it um, and then because it goes every like two years as well it's just the way it doesn't really conform to kind of what are, what people want it doesn't do it every four years it's like no we'll do it every two years we'll do it in the middle of the season it's one of those things I've always felt like it kind of it it doesn't really care um, about kind of like the European idea of how the football calendar should work and I've always found that quite interesting and engaging at the same time. So how did the tournament um, establish yourself initially how did it start? 
Yes, yeah, so it starts back in the 50s. Um, so it's kind of before we get that mass period of kind of like decolonization of lots of the African states. Um, so you only have four teams or four countries at the beginning that are kind of truly independent coming together. So you've got Egypt, Ethiopia, Sudan and South Africa are there. Um, so in the 50s, they kind of come together and decide they want to set up uh, what we now know as CAF, the Confederation of African Football uh, it takes them a while to kind of get recognition from FIFA, uh, but they eventually get that. They then all meet during one of these kind of FIFA conventions that happened quite a lot. I think it's in Lisbon that they all come together and decide that they want to hold a continental tournament. Uh, not quite continental when you think it's just four of them uh, coming together to do it. They decide initially it's going to be in Egypt, then they decide it's going to be in Sudan just because of things that were going on in Egypt at the time. So it gets kind of slated for 1957. They do the draw. Then South Africa say we're only going to send either a fully white team or a what they called like a fully coloured team. Uh, the other three nations are like that's completely unacceptable, um, especially in this era where it's kind of the decolonisation movements are starting to happen. They're starting to kind of be this kind of movement towards independence and stuff. So they're quite hot on not wanting South Africa to just send a white team or just send they say no you have to send a mixed team South Africa refused so they're kind of kicked out of the tournament to begin with so we have this, this kind of bizarre first tournament where it's just Egypt Ethiopia and Sudan um Ethiopia goes straight through to the final because they're meant to play South Africa um Egypt naturally win this tournament I think if people kind of know a little bit more about kind of early footballing history like Egypt are present at the Olympics in the 1920s so they've got some footballing pedigree behind them compared to Ethiopian Sudan but yeah that's how kind of the first couple of teams and that, that happens in the 50s and then from the 60s that's when it, it really just starts to grow because nations are becoming free from the colonial rule and they can kind of actually participate in the tournament. So in the 50s and 60s who were the most dominant nations in regards to the tournament? Yeah, so definitely Egypt at the beginning. They were quite comfortably the most dominant side. Um, although at one point they do change their name to kind of the United Arab Republic. So it's like them and um, Syria, I think, is kind of joined together uh, to become kind of like one one nation, even though most of the players are actually Egyptian at the time. Um, the 60s is when Ghana turn up. And Ghana then do dominate the tournament for the early 60s, at least up until... I think they pretty much to kind of there. They make every final from kind of 63 to 70 onwards. Um, well, 63 to 70, sorry, the 70 is their last final that they make under that kind of era of players. Um, and they kind of dominate more in a sense because of kind of political kind of leanings, I guess you could say, from Kwame Nkrumah, who comes in as the kind of first post, um, the first independence, like prime minister leader of Ghana at the time very big football fan uh he like gets his own team together uh he kind of they play against like Real Madrid and stuff like that so he was very much kind of in tune with what a lot of countries are now about how big football can be in terms of like projecting an image of a nation um so he was really hot on that and he used the football team as kind of a way to show what Ghana could do uh, they had like an actual African coach. Lots of people were going for these kind of Eastern European coaches at the time, but they go for, um, I think it's Charles Gamphy comes in and he kind of wins them the tournament. He's actually the last person to win them the tournament as well. He, they kind of bring him back in a couple of later, see, late, later years. Um, but yeah, so Ghana and Egypt, because I think most people know Egypt have kind of been one of those sides that are always strong throughout the history of kind of African football. But in the 60s, Ghana were kind of like the team that were just very entertaining and very kind of dominant in that sense. So I remember 1974 World Cup when you had what was then known as IEA, now the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, they were the first Africa side, I believe, to vote in the qualify for the World Cup. When did they start to dominate the um, tournament? So kind of there, they come just at kind of the end of like Ghana's sort of period of power, I guess you could say in the 60s and it's kind of a similar story in the sense that you get a leader who recognises the kind of positive image that football can have for them. And that's obviously Mobutu. Uh, lots of people know him from kind of like the rumble in the jungle and all that sort of stuff. Like he, he knew what sport could do for him. Um, so he starts to kind of invest a little bit more, not just financially, but kind of like politically in the side, changes the nickname to the Leopards because he always always like Leopards and stuff and all that sort of thing. So they win their first tournament in 68. Um, they then have a couple of seasons where they're not kind of great. 
a couple of years of tournaments where they're not not as good as they could be. Like they have the players. Uh, he's even bought some players back from kind of Belgium because he wanted everyone to be within Zaire at the time. Like he he ran this whole kind of Zaranization campaign where people changed their names. Like he got rid of lots of the kind of old colonial names of like companies buildings people streets all that sort of stuff so he was very much kind of if you're going to play for us you have to be here um and then yeah then 74 they win like they, they probably could have done better in 72 like they they should have done better in 72 but in 74 they win their second tournament uh they beat zambia in the only game i think the only final that ever went to two legs uh quite a rare thing to have a final that goes over two kind of games but they get through it goes into extra time in the first game Zambia score literally at the death they have to come back again and play again um Muhammad Ali is actually watching he does turn up to watch the final as well um so it's, it's strange because obviously like you said like 74 the world cup lots of people remember the team well, that's their image of that Zaire side is kind of a little bit chaotic, a little bit like lots of those chat back not knowing the rules and stuff like that, which we now know wasn't the case. There was a lot more going on behind the scenes politically, but they're coming into that tournament after winning their second AFCON. Like they are the best team in Africa, clearly at that time. Um, and they were a good team. Like if you watch them play in these kind of tournaments and stuff, the football they could put, like the passes they string together, the technical ability of the players was just like really, really cool to watch. Sticking to that team, obviously talk about 74 World Cup and I know the whole frame of oh, we didn't know the rules and whatnot because they kicked the ball before a free kick was taken against Brazil. But obviously there's more of us come out in the last few years regarding what's happened. Can you just elaborate on that in terms of the pressure that was going into that side, um, on that side going into that tournament? Yeah, so I think it, it all comes back to Mobutu. And if you don't know what Mobutu is like, I mean, you just need to kind of Google his name and look at some of the stories of this man because he was very, very dictatorial, uh, very, very kind of controlling everything, like kind of making sure all his kind of powers were were well compensated. And that kind of becomes part of the story. Like they take this massive entourage with them to the World Cup of kind of people, like officials that don't really need to be there, they're spending money that should be spent on the players. Eventually, after I think it's after the first game, they're trying to like interfere. Um, and Vladko Vinic is kind of like team selection and stuff like that. Like they want the goalkeeper changed at one point. And it just it becomes like a massive mess. Like the players aren't happy. They also know that there's threats obviously coming from Mabuti because they're all now based there. It's not like now where like some players could probably be quite removed from kind of political things that are going on in their country because they're just playing in a different country. But at this point, they're all playing there. Their families are there. Um, and it's really tragic. They go back and it's just, that's it. Like after the World Cup, and Bucci just pulls all his support. The players, like some of them, I think there's one, um, I think it was Malamba, one of their best best strikers ends up kind of in South Africa, living in a township for many, many years after he there's like a robbery and he injures himself. He ends up in South Africa and just stays there. Like these kind of players that should be kind of celebrated, should have been celebrated for what they achieved were kind of like hounded out of the game and then just not really ever kind of compensated for what they were able to achieve because of the political interference that took, like took place throughout that tournament. And there's a really good book actually called Zaire 74 that if people are interested in kind of really diving into the story, you should definitely check out. Uh, they go into like a lot more detail of kind of the ins and out of what was actually happening behind the scenes. And then you, when you then know what's happening behind the scenes, when you see like what you said with the free kick and kind of the defeat they have, uh, I think it was to Yugoslavia, wasn't it, where they get absolutely battered and it's yeah. kind of, it makes a lot more sense. Gosh. So going to the 70s now, and is there any one team that's dominating? Because I know Algeria will come up, especially in 80. Two World Cup, or was there only one team dominated in the nineteen seventies? Not as much. So the way I kind of tried to split the book up was into that kind of eras of of dominant sides, and Zaire is kind of the team I picked for the seventies, just because obviously for the World Cup and in seventy four, um, Ghana come back a little bit. Like so, Morocco obviously they win their first ever and only title in seventy six. Then Ghana win their the most recent title they've won, which is seventy eight which is absolutely crazy when you think about it. Um, so kind of post Zaire, it, it kind of, it does open up a little bit. Um, there's no kind of one dominant team, but you do start to see Nigeria coming through. 
Uh, so they make kind of the semi-finals twice, even though 76 doesn't really count because it was like it was like a round robin kind of taught like group stage five where it was just a league table at the end. But they make the semi-final in the, in 1978. And that's when we start to see Nigeria kind of come to the fore as one of those sides that then go on to be one of the more dominant teams, maybe more like kind of like 90s time. Going back to what you said about Ghana, you're saying Ghana's last win was in 1978. Yeah. What are the reasons for it? Because they've produced some wonderful players since. So, I, I think it's like it's been part like bad luck as well, I guess you could say. Sorry, no, their last one was actually 82. I got it wrong. But still, that's quite a long time. It's quite a long time, isn't it? So from 82, I think it's kind of bad luck in the sense that when they've had their good teams, there's just been better teams. Uh, which is just one of those really unfortunate moments. In 1992, they probably could have won it, but their best player, Bidu Pele, wasn't available for the final. Um, and that's always been a sore point for a lot of Ghanaian fans, is that if he'd been there, maybe they could have been the co- beaten the Cote d'Ivoire in 92. And you think about the team, kind of like 2008-2010 World Cup, that loads of people remember, like the Azamarajan kind of era. They just couldn't really translate that success that they had at the World Cup into anything in AFCON that kind of got them over the line. And and then we saw at the most recent tournament, I think this is feels like the lowest point they've been at for a long time. Um, it doesn't feel like you could be like, oh, it's just like bad coaching. It feels like the talent level isn't as high as it has been in previous years for Ghana. And yeah, I think they, they're having a lot of kind of reflections on what's gone wrong and trying to work out because like you said, they've produced some amazing players and they've they've had some great teams, but it's just never really worked at AFCON. I think the thing is AFCON's so hard to win anyway as a tournament. I think it is just like one of the more tough ones, but you'd still have expected them to have at least won one but since 1982. Yeah. You talked before about the coaching and how initially a lot of African teams they would have Eastern European um, coaches. Watching the recent tournament, that seems to be a little bit of the case now. I'm not necessarily used to European, but certainly um, European and I think a couple of South Americans. Apart from, say, Alou Cisse, who's one of the most highly profile for Senegal. In terms of the coaching of African football, how has that developed? Because, as I say, in terms of an, even the most established, like Ghana and Cameroon, they seem to have more outside of Africa. So on the coaching front, how has coaching developed in Africa? Is there any schemes that are happening at the moment to help those um, countries develop? Not that I'm aware of. Um, I'm sure there probably are. But I think what we've seen is probably, for, like it just this is kind of like just what my opinion is on the situation. Like, this might not be completely kind of accurate, but you see a lot of like players have been able to make the transition from that. They don't really play in their domestic leagues and they get to go and play in Europe. But we've never seen the coaches given that opportunity to go into Europe and kind of develop there, even though we've got some great kind of African coaches, like you look at the likes of Stephen Keshi, obviously no longer with us, but he was one of the, one of the best. Uh, he's like done amazing jobs with Togo. He did a great job in Nigeria and winning them the, the tournament in 2013, I think it was. So they, they're out there. I think that's the thing. And they're, they're in the domestic leagues. They're doing well in the domestic leagues, but they just don't seem to be given the opportunities that lesser kind of rated European managers seem to get. Um, I don't know what what the bias is behind that. Um, it just it seems to be, and you just hope that, like, yeah, like you said, Ali Cisse, he's he's kind of the trailblazer a little bit for that in the sense that showing what what can be done. And what should, in my opinion, what should be done, because I know that in England, we've always had that debate, haven't we, used to have about like whether a non-English manager could ever win with England. It was always one of those things. And that doesn't seem to always be kind of the narrative that you get in African football, um, even though they're, they're definitely, out. I think this is kind of, it's the next kind of level of kind of, I wouldn't say like developing the game, because I think that's a bit unfair to suggest that it needs to be developed I think it's already in a really strong place and it's kind of equal of footing on lots of places but it's the next kind of process that needs to happen in terms of giving these guys opportunities to show what they can do um because there are there are some really good coaches out there we've seen them kind of in the kind of champ they like the Champions League to like African Champions League that most of them kind of maybe go to like the UAE or kind of North Africa to coach as well because they're, there's more money there's just like stronger teams up there but than getting the job in national team. But they might not want it because a lot of people, 
you probably give them one AFCON and if it goes badly, you, you're out the door. So there's not actually that much time to build something up. Whereas Ali Cissé has been given the time and he's shown what you can do if you give someone that time to experience tournaments and then bring their team through. Yeah, it just seems I'd say that the coaching hasn't quite caught up yet. I think it's improving, but not quite caught up. Um, in regards to the 80s, I imagine obviously a couple of things happen. You get obviously Algeria start well, I think, in the 80s, special qualifier for the World Cup. And you start to get more African um, countries that actually are entered in the World Cup because the World Cup's increased from 16 to 24 nations. How did that have an effect on African football, the increase of nations and in, in the um, African nations in the World Cup? So I think one of the kind of big kind of impacts, I guess, of that is this is more exposure to African players. And then you start to see this movement of African players leaving their domestic leagues not as early as they do now, or like they barely touch like their domestic leagues. Maybe they don't even play in them at the moment, but they start to leave their domestic leagues to go play in other countries. And like Cameroon is one of the best examples of that. You see a lot of that squad of the 80s, which in my mind is the best team of the 80s. Like they were the strongest side. Like you've got Roger Miller, you've got a couple of other guys that go and play in France and stuff like that. So it's just that greater exposure to other kind of, styles of football as well rather than just playing the same teams every year you're playing against kind of these big big nations that have players that are playing all over the world and stuff like that and like you said like Algeria is interesting for them because obviously they make the world cup but in the 80s they don't make I don't think they make an AFCON final they do it in the 90s and they get their first tournament win there but you think about how good that team was and then to not be able to have won in like on the continent I think it again shows Another reason a little bit why I love this tournament so much is that we can see, like we saw Morocco, obviously, at the most recent World Cup, do really, really well. But then they barely kind of did much at this most recent tournament, like going out to South Africa. And that's just what happens because the pressure is completely different. Like the pressure is off at the World Cup. You can, no one expects an African nation to win. I think lots of people want an African nation to finally win the World Cup because that will feel like the big kind of moment that we all are waiting for. But when you go back to AFCON, it's suddenly like you're the big nation, you're under pressure. So I think through the 80s, it is that sort of transition as well. You've got more kind of countries coming out of colonialism. We're like almost, we've almost got the full set of people back kind of running their own states and being able to compete as well. So African football itself is expanding. And then like you said, with the World Cup, it's expanding. So it's kind of like a transition period of growth for players starting to leave and kind of moving towards kind of what we more kind of see today. Would you be fair to say that the 80s was the time in which the African Cup of Nations really started to hit a global audience where it become more well-known worldwide outside of Africa? I think I'd probably say just from what kind of like the research I've done, I, I felt more the 90s was that period of where you start to see it more. Just because we get more kind of televisions are more kind of normal, I guess like we could say there's more kind of being spread around and then you obviously get kind of like South Africa coming back so that's a big story and Nigeria and stuff and I think in the 90s you see a lot more of that and like people I've spoken to have said that those are the tournaments they kind of remember being able to watch if they weren't in kind of on the continent or in those countries and even like some of the early tournaments weren't even like televised within the kind of continent itself so the 90s is that kind of push towards it becoming more popular and I think this most recent tournament and like a couple of the more recent ones feels like it's got even kind of grown even more in terms of a global stage I feel like there's been more people I don't know what the numbers are by off the top of my head but it's just felt like there's been more people paying attention this tournament that's just passed in the Cote d'Ivoire than there has been for like some of the other ones so it's definitely grown but I think the 90s is the period where that really does start the longest one well, no, the first tournament I watched African um, Cup of Nations tournament I watched was 92 when um, Ghana, sorry, Ivory Coast beat Ghana on penalties. And I think it was probably the longest penalty shootout I've seen. Was it about 26 penalties, I believe? I think it's close to, yeah, I think it was like 21, 22. Like, if it, just one of those like mammoth penalty shootouts, but that's like not abnormal, is it? With <laughs> the Africa Cup of Nations, like we have seen that before where it just goes to penalties and it's nice because I guess goalkeepers get their moment, don't they? Like it's a chance for the goalkeepers to become the heroes and stuff like that. But 
it's not something that many of us like neutral wise it's quite fun to watch isn't it but if you're not a neutral like penalty shootout it's just it's the worst thing yeah yeah which country did hosted that tournament do you remember uh so nice to that was senegal oh, i think yeah. it was i hosted that one there you go one of the interesting aspects of your book is when you talk about south africa because as a teenager i remember watching the uh, rugby world cup in 95 and um, mandela in the springbok jersey giving a trophy to france alpina but and most people say that as like a defining Af- sports African moment. But in your book, I think you mentioned that it was more like the year after with the football that seemed to be more defining. Whereas I think outside of Africa, it seems to be the rugby, but inside it tends to be that tournament. Yeah, and I think I think that's it's maybe just because it's also been like it's been Hollywood. We've had Hollywood turn a turn it into a film and stuff like that. But I think for my kind of what I've seen and kind of looked at and stuff is that while that kind of bridged the kind of divide maybe between what was a predominantly very white sport with the kind of actual, like the population or mass like Mandela, kind of that coming together of those two Mandela and that really white sport, the football in my mind from what like I've watched and stuff, it's just a little bit more, it's kind of finally seeing what he talks about in terms of that rainbow nation, Like it's the realization of the rainbow nation because it's a mixed team and it's like this is kind of how the society needs to go forward is together and you watch kind of that final of 95 and the crowd is just it's all white like I'm I'm sure there may have been some people that weren't white but the crowd just in from what I saw just looked completely white you get to the 96 football final and it's a completely mixed crowd and they're singing together they're hugging together like they're really together um and I think the the football team, in like f- in my opinion, from what like I think deserves more, kind of a Hollywood Hollywoodization of its story or a film about their story because what they did was just as special, but it's not really thought of as a special. And I think that may be also because maybe outside of Africa, some people hold the Rugby World Cup as like a higher level of tournament than the Africa Cup of Nations, but there's more teams playing football than there are rugby. Like there's, there's not as much competition in the rugby, but I think that they're important for different reasons. But in my mind, the football is more realization, like I said, of the rainbow nation of what Mandela spoke about and stuff like that. Going back to the eighties, you mentioned that a lot of African players were going to Europe to play, but it seems from your book and bits I've read that most of those players were from um, going to France, which is understandable because obviously shared language. So it's the nineties where they actually started going to different countries in Europe, be it England or Germany or um Italy or Spain. Yes, I think it still is predominantly France. And I think that's just always been the case. And it probably will always be the case, just because the way France colonized and then decolonized was in a very particular way that meant like the movement between was still quite possible. Um Whereas in like in England, we kind of know now as well, like it's it's not very easy to come here. Like we're quite shutting of borders and stuff like that. So it's always been a little bit more difficult. Um, whereas for France, like you said, shared language, they can move across and like they'll play there. And then they'll go, some will like stay there, have children, children and be born there. And then they'll go play for France. Like we've seen that a lot as well. Like there's a, It's just a little bit more of a fluid kind of system in that sense. Um, but you do start to see more players going to England, like you've got your Boa at that point, you've got a couple of the South African players going and uh, playing in England at the time of the 96 tournament as well. Uh, Belgium has a couple more players, that's always been kind of a route, especially for players from like um, the, the now DRC, that's a like really kind of normal route. But you do see, I don't think from what I remember looking at kind of the makeover teams, you don't see it as widespread as you do now where you've got players going to like different parts of Europe as well, kind of like more Eastern European countries or Central European countries. I think it's still very much going to kind of the old colonial kind of teams because there are those connections between the countries still. Um, But it's definitely kind of feels like the start of that period when you look at kind of the teams at the beginning of the 90s and you kind of just go through the squad list and look where they play. And then you get to the end of the 90s, you go through the squad list and you look where they play. You see that there's been that transition between like there's more money now in the in the European game at that point as well, so they can bring these players over. It makes sense for them to go there financially because they'll actually get paid a, a more than they would at home. So it's kind of 
the the transition i guess is kind of happening there in the 90s off the back of the 80s so it starts in the 80s and then it accelerates to other countries in the 90s talking about obviously the african cup of nations actually that's the book you wrote but how is the club game developing in this time yeah so as in just now or like during the during the time so during it like how was what was the standard of the club game in africa at the start of african um cup of nations and how did that uh develop did it get any better was it worse did it plateau like how did it develop yeah i, I have to say i'm not like entirely sure but just based on kind of looking at kind of the, the players that were playing for these teams and kind of I have spoken to a couple of people about like the the like players now and their parents who played and stuff like that. And it is the teams were domestically probably stronger then than they will be now, just because they were able to have like actual internationals play for them. Like it's very rare you'll get a domestic player playing for some of the big teams in Africa. But you'll get like every now and then we'll get sort of like we have with Mozambique in this tournament. Like you get a Mozambique turn up and they've got loads more domestic players. And that for me is like, I love that because it's like, I never will see the Mozambique league, but I'll get to see these players play for their national team. Um, but I think it's just, and now as well, like we've just seen it, it's shifted so much where the top talents will rarely get a chance to play for their domestic sides, like the big domestic sides within their kind of countries, especially kind of Nigeria, Ghana, where you've now got lots of these kind of, micro football academies I guess you could call them where players will go they'll get developed and then they'll transition over um, I know like the Aspire Academy I think they've got Aspires in Senegal and Ghana where players will go young players will develop and they probably won't play for your kind of Aqua Hearts of Lions um, your TP Bazembe's maybe slightly more you'd get like in the DRC you may get some more they're still really really strong teams I think North Africa is still strong South Africa still has a decent club kind of level because they can pay wages. That means it's not always worth these players leaving to go to Europe. Like they can earn, most of them can earn more in South Africa. So that like, why would I leave South Africa to go earn less in Europe when I could still play, I'll still play for my national team. If I stay in South Africa, I'll still compete for continental titles in South Africa. It doesn't really make sense. So some nations like, like North African teams and then the South Africa have been able to. And then there's a couple of other like decent teams around, but it's I don't think it's as like going to be as strong just because they can't keep the talent that they used to be able to. So in the nineties, and for me, I don't know if you agree, but the most exciting African nation of the nineties was Nigeria. Um could two things. How did they do it? Well, a few things. How did they do in African Cup of Nations? How was their World Cup exploits seen back home? And obviously, 96, they won the Olympic gold as well. So how did African football as a whole view that Olympic gold? Yeah, so Nigeria in the 90s, it's just, they, yeah, like you said, they're one of my favourite teams to have watched. But unfortunately for the African Cup of Nations, we don't really see them as much as we probably would have liked. Uh, so they make the final in 1990 lose to Algeria. They make the semi-finals in 1992. Uh, they win the bronze medal there, but I've always found it weird to talk about the bronze medal in the African Cup of Nations because I don't think it really carries much much weight. I think you, you the final or bust is kind of the best you can really think of. But then 94, that's like where they're quite terrifying. Uh, that's where they have like Yakeni, uh, Akocha, like all those guys are playing at that point and they face Zambia in the final go one nil down but then they win they win two one in that one so that should have been the start of their dominant era like in my mind when i wrote the book like the 90s while south africa was the story that probably shouldn't have ever happened it should have been the 90s should have been the nigeria kind of chapter would have been the 90s and a little bit later but it basically kind of all kind of unfurls in terms of the african cup of nations um when I think it's Sonia Batcha at the time, I can't I'll always get confused as to which dictator, <laughs> the military dictator at the time, uh, where he basically kills uh, some human rights activists uh, during the 90s, like kind of state state killing. Like So it's like everyone knows it's going to happen. Mandela calls it out. Uh, Desmond Tutu calls it out. This thing creates like a diplomatic spat between South Africa and Nigeria. 
obviously the tournament at that point is about to be hosted in 1996 in South Africa. Nigeria is defending champions. They qualify automatically. Uh, then they go to uh, the president. The president says, because of the diplomatic dispute between these two countries, I don't want the team to go and play in South Africa, so we're not playing. Uh, so they don't play in 96. They're then banned from 98 for withdrawing in 96. So they missed two tournaments that you think they probably could have won because that team was so good. And they obviously didn't go and win that Olympic gold in 96, which I still think in Nigeria is viewed as one of the biggest footballing successes. Um, I think it's interesting because like for me, per on a personal level, I've never really rated Olympic football as kind of that high. But I, in my mind, that's underneath kind of like your, your Africa Cup of Nations and your kind of continental tournaments I'd rate high. I'd go like World Cup, then continental tournaments, then an Olympic, because maybe at the time it was more than what it is now. But in my mind, it's never been that important a competition. Uh, but for Nigeria, it's been one of their kind of calling cards of that 96 team, uh, for that team of the 90s. Um, and I think they would have had more African Cup of Nations titles if they'd been actually able to compete throughout the 90s because their, their team was just quite frightening to be honest like I wouldn't have wanted to defend against any of those strikers like yeah Kenny would have probably injured me by just like running past me uh the man was an absolute absolute beast um so yeah it's, it's a shame that that team didn't get to win it but there is a great documentary I think it's on Amazon Prime on the 96 kind of Olympic win um, where they speak to all the players and they speak to all the coaches and all that sort of stuff. So it's really, really good kind of documentary, well worth watching. And kind of it shows how important that kind of gold medal was to Nigerian football. Um, but it should, in my opinion, should have come alongside a lot more, a lot more other kind of final appearances and, and trophies. One country which could have also done one in the 90s, but through um, tragedy didn't, was Zambia. How good were that was that actual team? So they were or still are considered the kind of the golden generation of Zambian football. Uh, even now, even though the the team in twenty twelve won, they're not considered the best Zambian team ever. The best Zambian team ever is, is that team of the nineties. Um, they could have made the World Cup. I don't want to say they would have made the World Cup, but they were good enough to make the World Cup. Like Everyone kind of agrees that that team could have made the World Cup, which it's just, it's such a tragedy that they, the, with what happened, like for people that don't know, um, they were flying from Zambia to get to Senegal for a World Cup qualifier. When they leave Gabon, the, the plane just crashes into the sea and everyone on board dies. It's just awful. And the, the tragedy as well is that this wasn't something that wasn't foreseen. Like they were there wasn't enough money pumped into that side in terms of logistics and stuff. They're flying on very old military planes that shouldn't have been flying. So it's a real tragedy, but to then come back and make the final in 94 without that team. So they just, they literally go around the country holding trials, bring another team together, make the final of 94. Thanks to players like Kalisha, uh, one of the best Zambian players ever. Uh, he's the man, if people don't know that, if you see images of them celebrating in 2012, the man in the suit that's being chucked up and down, that's him. Uh, he's then becomes president of the FA. He is there. Probably the best Zambian player ever, uh, in my opinion. Um, but that team was was something special and they, they deserved that chance at the World Cup. Uh, they deserved to probably have won, won an Afcon as well. I think they would have been competitive. They might have been unlucky that Nigeria were up and coming as well. I don't know if they'd been able to beat them uh, even on that day, but it just yeah one of the biggest tragedies but then 2012 is just like that makes 2012 such a beautiful moment when they do win in Gabon near where the crash happened it's kind of one of those like it had to be sort of moments yeah so all that's happened we get into the 2000s and obviously Senegal do well in the 2022 World Cup get to the um, quarterfinal second African nation to do so was that their decade early 2000s Senegal or what uh, was it a bit of a more of a not one team dominating, just other teams that are um, winning and doing well? So early 2000s is more Cameroon comeback. Uh, so we get Samuel Eto's kind of early career then, uh, and it's his side. And that's a team that beat Senegal in 2002 AFCON um, final. Uh, but that's, yeah, so they are like almost non-existent for most of Africa Cup of Nations past like they, they do turn up every now and then but they're not 
the kind of strong nation that we see them today. We see them today as like one of the premier sides in African football. And that's because of 2000, like the early 2000s, like you said, like they make that 2002 World Cup. They get players like El Hajjouf and people like that. And it's because they kind of tap into the diaspora that they have in France. So we talked earlier about kind of that movement of players to France. They're then able to use that for players that have been born maybe a couple of generations out who are eligible to play for them that they can then bring back into the team. So they can kind of blend homegrown players with players that have like learned through the French academies. Um, so yeah, they make that final in 2002, lose on penalties. Alou Cisse, as everyone probably knows, misses the penalty. And that's kind of, that actually does drive him to win it when they do um, in a couple of years ago, wasn't it? Yeah, so they aren't really the dominant side of the early 2000s. It is Cameroon. Cameroon went back to back, uh, back to back on penalties as well. So they're kind of like penalty experts at that time. In that, just after them, Tunisia then get their first win at home, their only win as well. And then we get Egypt, like from 2006, 2010, win three on the bounce. No one has done that. I don't think anyone ever is going to do that again. Uh, I think African football now is just it's too competitive for a team to be able to dominate for three tournaments in a row. But they win three on the bounce and they are... For me, like when I was growing up, that's if you told me Africa Cup of Nations when I was a kid, I'd think of Egypt. Like I just kind of put the two together uh, because of just how dominant that team was. What was the secret to Egypt's success at that time? I think they just, they had a collective that was really good. Um, so it's not like now where we think of like Mo Salah kind of has to drag that team through. Like they've got some very good players now, but he's like the pinnacle and we kind of think if it's, if he doesn't do it, no one's going to do it. Whereas that team, it just had so many good players that could kind of gel together. And they just had this, like, we are not going to lose this game sort of attitude about everything. So they bring in Hassan Shahata as the coach to kind of lead them at home. They've had some pretty bad times before they get to the 2006 tournament that they host. But he comes in and he just kind of manages the squad really well. So Mido's kind of like the big name striker at that point. But when Mido's not firing, he's more than happy to take him off and chuck on Amir Zaki. He does that a couple of times and it works. Mido then goes home and they still win the tournament because he just uses all these other strikers. Um, Ghetto, as well as another. Like, he just seemed to pick out every tournament. Shahata would kind of pick out a striker that he'd kind of rely on to get them through games. So you had like Zidane one, one game and then you'd have like Ghetto and another Abu Troika, one of the wingers. He was a fantastic player. Ahmed Hassan. Like, they had just a really solid defence, really solid midfield. They had creativity on the wings and they had people that could score goals. So they were one of the most kind of complete teams and every year he'd kind of find a striker that people weren't really thinking of, bring them into the squad and they'd score important goals. Um, so they just built up this kind of mentality, like a winning mentality that they've not had since then, in my opinion. They just, you just watch some of the games they played in the finals and stuff and you just felt like this team was determined to win and they kind of would do anything to win. Um, so I don't think they have that. They've not really rediscovered that mentality amongst the squad for a couple of years now. We talked about, um, well, certain teams withdrawing when this whole to um, tournament was first established. But one team that's withdrawn, again, because of tragedy, was Togo. Um, when her bus was attacked, can you just explain into detail what happened there and also the aftermath for that team? Yeah, so it's 2010. Uh, so it's 2010 and we go to Angola for the tournament. And they make a really interesting decision to have one of the host kind of cities, I guess you could say, in uh, the Cabinda region, which if you look at the map, it isn't actually in Angola. It's just like kind of above it. Uh, and then there's like a country in between. I can never remember which country it is that's in between. My geography just failing me right now. Uh, but... They, they pick Cabinda as kind of one of the places to go. So I think it's the DRC that obviously, yeah, sorry, complete brain fart. Uh, so the DRC kind of splits them in and then you've got this Cabinda region where they decide to have the tournament. But the Cabinda region has historically had this kind of successionist movement. So they wanted to be independent. So there's been kind of an ongoing sort of like conflict between a rebel group and the, the state. Um, for many, many years. Um, but they decide that we'll, we'll still put people there. Um, and it's during when the Togo team are travelling between places within that that the bus comes under attack uh, by this rebel group. Uh, tragically, 
some I think a couple of the coaching staff or staff members do lose their lives the bus driver I'm pretty sure loses his life as well um a couple of the players get injured uh, if I remember rightly one of the goalkeepers that, that ended his career uh he's since gone on to do this amazing kind of charity work uh for kind of people with disabilities and stuff like that so he's really kind of like turned it into something positive out of what's just horrific um they get back to the hotel and obviously then they're like, we're not playing in this tournament because why would you want to play in this tournament? It hasn't even started at this point. Uh, Adam Bayor is kind of like the spokesperson. He is the kind of the centrepiece of this team. He is kind of, the reason they're successful is because of Emmanuel Adebayor. Like He's one of the best strikers that Africa has produced and definitely the best striker Togo have produced. So he says they're not going to play. They withdraw. Kath then actually banned them um, from future tournaments but it's then rescinded because obviously everyone's like that's actually ridiculous that you could ever think about doing that but the tournament goes on in Cabinda like they still play games in the region and stuff like that so Togo withdraw but they just they keep the tournament keeps going uh which is quite quite strange you'd think maybe they'd have tried to move it but they they kept going um so yeah it was a really really horrible kind of moment especially for the Togolese team that they still kind of talk about today and they still get quite emotional about. So let's bring up to modern day. Obviously we had the tournaments um in Ivory Coast. How on earth did Ivory Cote d'Ivoire win that tournament? Bear in mind they did so badly in the group. Like they had won the first game but then they'd done badly in the last couple of group games. So how did it happen? On well, us it's just a absolutely bizarre, wasn't it? Absolutely bizarre that they could kind of look that bad under Gasquet for like two, three, even the first game, it looked amazing. And then they bring in Immerse Faye, who's like my only memory of Immerse Faye, because I'm a Reading fan. He was like one of our record signings that we barely ever actually saw play. So it was kind of like a weird, ah, oh, but he's like now coaching and doing stuff like that. But I think it's, it kind of shows the beauty of the tournament in a way that you almost, once you get past the group stages, you almost kind of have to just forget everything that you've just witnessed and start the tournament almost afresh. Um, because I think if we'd gone into that group stages, everyone just thought Senegal and Morocco were going all the way because Senegal looked incredible during the group stages. They were playing fantastic football and destroying loads of teams. Morocco looked solid and great as well. But it's just the the kind of the knockouts just completely change. It's a completely different tournament at that point. And you've got that home crowd behind you kind of spurring you on. I think they bought into that. And I think in a way it kind of worked for them having thought that they were out and then being back in it sent that sense of like we can't waste this opportunity now and I think as soon as they yeah they started to kind of motor through you felt like once they got to the final you just thought they were going to do it I think I it was just in that mind it's like this team's got the momentum it's kind of like the Egypt of the kind of 2000s in that sense of that we're going to win every game but it's more like we're not going to give up in any game and we will take our chances when they come. And that's what I think they were so good at was they just stuck around in so many games. Like they really should have lost uh, in the semi-final to, to the DRC. They should have lost to Mali as well. I think, was it Mali or, I can't remember, which was Mali or Guinea, one of those teams that they were playing where, yeah, it was Mali just absolutely dominated them and should have won and then they somehow win it in the end. So I think it was just like, that ability to hang around is so kind of underrated within kind of football. And I think with that in AFCON, you just, if you haven't seen it before, you just yeah, get to the knockout stage and then forget everything you've seen in the group stages and just start the tournament again, because anything can happen. Is, um, cause we're almost coming up towards the end. Is there um, a favorite tournament that you have a particular um, edition of the tournament? I think, You've kind of, you've already mentioned the South Africa one. I think for me, that's always one that I really enjoyed looking at and watching because I watched a lot of the games because you you can find them on kind of YouTube and stuff like that. And I really enjoyed watching as the kind of the team progresses through the tournament, knowing what's going to happen, but seeing them start to believe each way. And in 2012 with Zambia, I think you watch those first couple of games and like there's no inclination at that point that they were going to win the tournament at all in 2012. You're just watching it, you're like, well, they look quite fun, they look quite good. But no one, even like the commentators, the way they're talking, you can tell they don't feel like this is a team to take seriously. But then as you get through and through and through, like the narrative of the tragedy starts to come and play in and then it's just 
it snowballs and then they get to the final and despite playing against the likes of Drogba and all that for them to win it that for me is probably one of my favourite tournaments even though it wasn't the final wasn't a classic and we've had better finals it's just the narrative and the kind of the story and the context behind it is what makes some of these tournaments more kind of memorable for me than others Ben it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you Um, if people want to find a book where can I go? Yes you can get it uh, Amazon, you can get it on Smiths. I think you get it in Waterstones as well. If you just search Africa Cup of Nations, History of an Underappreciated Tournament, yeah, you can get it from any of those that you, you fancy, I guess. Cool. Looks like it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for coming on to the podcast. No worries. Thanks, Chris, for having me.